Hello and welcome back to the C. Thomas Printer Cooperative, a place to make you think, make you remember, and make you smile. April 30th, 2023. Good morning. I'm Rosetta Jones and welcome back to Bygone Relics. I'm here with C. Thomas Printer, who's going to take us back in history today to... 1893, is that true? Good morning, austerity. And yes, I am. I recently had the good fortune to take a vacation, which included a couple connecting flights. I booked through one airline and was able to select my seats, and I had an exit row and a little extra leg room. But on a couple legs, I didn't have that option. But flights were on time to my destination, the seats were good, and I had a nice time while on vacation. Traveling home, the first legs of the flight were good, but then I looked down at my seat selection for the last leg, and I saw with doom 32D. Oh. I asked the flight agent if there was any other options to move to a window seat, which is my pre preferred seat. But like most flights after COVID, the flight was 100% full. As I made my way onto the airplane and back to my seat, I saw with dread that a very large woman was sitting in my seat. When I asked if she was in the right seat, she realized that no, she was in the middle seat. She scoots over, oh. and by scoots over, not very far, and there <laughs> isn't room for the arm bar to even come down. So for the next seven hours, we were shoulder to shoulder with some of myself hanging out over onto the aisle, at least one cheek worth. Better yet, I'm in the last row and sitting in the aisle right in front of the bathroom. So there is a queue of people waiting to use the bathroom the entire time. And I can confirm that people have to use the bathroom before the plane takes off, when the seatbelt light is on, when they should be in their seats. And also, they make particularly unpleasant smells on an airplane as well. To cap off this trifecta of perturbations, I had the good fortune of having a crying baby sitting across <laughs> the aisle from me. The flight attendant sensed my dismay and offered me free alcoholic drinks on the house. But I declined despite having the feeling that I was trapped. For the next seven hours, my life was not going to be good, and it wasn't. I was trapped, and all these things were out of my control. But I could control my perspective about them. I could look on the bright side. My flight wasn't canceled. I was lucky enough to take a vacation in the first place, so that was good. And my first world problems were the result of living in a country where too many people took a flight, causing me some discomfort. Boo-hoo. Okay, see, Thomas, I got it. It was a very unpleasant uh, flight. But are you going to make a point about 1893 or rent about the airlines? I don't want you to end up on the do not fly list. Patience, austerity, patience. All right. I was trapped on that flight, and it wasn't anyone else's fault but my own. I had chosen the flight, I had taken a vacation, and I could have paid a lot more for a first-class seat, but I didn't. I was trapped, and it was my fault. Just like the Federal Reserve is trapped, and it is their fault. You like how I did that? <laughs> they, have left, they have left the interest rate too low for too long. And they let the genie out of the bottle, and now they're trying to put it back in, but it isn't cooperating. The debt is $31 trillion, and the interest on the debt interest expense is about to cross $1 trillion annually any day now. If they leave interest rates high to fight inflation, how are we going to fund the government without printing more money, which is inflationary? We have a currency that countries are actively trying not to use anymore, and we are only devaluing it more by printing more of it. Reserve currency be damned, this won't end well. But we have covered this already. I have asked you, the listener, to start following gold and silver and the dollar because the interplay of these three items will be very interesting in the future, just as they have been in the past. I have talked about how the end of fiat money never ends well. The end of the reserve currency days of the dollar are numbered, and they are. But what we haven't discussed is we are not on the gold standard. 
why we went off the silver standard and why is currency is backed by Joe Biden's promises today. Well, a good place to learn a little bit about this is from 1893. I was reading an article called The Silver Panic from 1978, written by Lawrence Reed. I will attach the link in the show notes because I was trying to understand how the inflationary 1970s was from the people's perspective. Reed writes about how the silver panic of 1893 led to the depression of 1893. He has a great line. Quote, in the case of the Panic of 1893, the tragedy is smothered with the fingerprints of politicians, end quote. Well, it naturally had my interest now. He <laughs> talks about the history of gold and silver and their relationship and the limitations this put on politicians and how the politicians tried to use government interference to manipulate the system. Ha <laughs> ha. America had dealt with inflation after the Revolutionary War and after the Civil War. So the populace was wary of money printing. But in 1875, the newly formed National Greenback Party called for currency inflation because inflation sounded good, even back then. The party was popular in the agricultural West and South, where post-Civil War had already brought a depression of 1873. In the 1880s, an agricultural depression led to the formation of the Populist Party, which wanted, you guessed it, inflation. Silver mining state Colorado even elected a populist governor in 1892 who supported, and let me quote this directly from the Colorado Encyclopedia. I will tell you what an encyclopedia is one day, austerity. Quote, <laughs> backing the U.S. dollar with silver because it would expand the money supply and result in inflation, yielding farmers higher prices for their crops while reducing the value of debts owed to banks and other creditors, end quote. The Populist Party arose because the actions of Congress had not gone far enough in the opinions of many. In 1878, Congressional Bill Bland Allison was passed, which was passed over the veto of then-President Rutherford B. Hayes. This bill had the government buy silver at an arranged price of 16 ounces, to one ounce of gold rather than let the free market decide the price of gold and silver. President Hayes said, quote, a currency worth less than it purports to be worth will in the end defraud not only creditors, but all who are engaged in legitimate business and none more surely than those who are dependent on their daily labor for their daily bread, end quote. This artificial buying was very popular in silver mining states like newly formed Colorado. This effect pumped dollars into the economy from the federal government into the hands of the people. So even when this country was on a metallic standard, the government couldn't help screwing it up. Being on a dual metallic standard, but having a government partner in the silver business meant that the price of silver started falling from 890 in 1878 to 600 in 1893. Gold capital left America and returned to Europe, and people couldn't trust the currency. And even Americans were trying to get their money out of the U.S. and into Canada, Europe, and even Latin America, which were all considered more secure than the U.S. D. Noyes wrote in Political Science Quarterly, quote, the coinage of overvalued silver dollars since 1878 and the issue of treasury notes on silver bullion since 1890 have actually increased the country's silver and paper circulation between 1879 and 1894 by 75%, end quote. How familiar. If you go back to 2008, the M2 money supply of the U.S. was just over $7 trillion. And now it is around, what, $21 trillion? Banks lended money easily as there was plenty of money in the system to pay loans back. This was back then. How familiar. Read again writes so well and directly, quote, The economy, drugged by easy money, was showing signs of prosperity. Unemployment, which had been above 5% in 1890 and 91, fell to 3.7% in 1892. The boom was, however, 
only temporary. The twin evils of inflation and uncertainty as to the fixity of the standard were eating at the vitals of the nation's commerce. Late in 1893, prices of staples such as wheat, previously on the rise, began to recede. How familiar. Iron ore prices are down 50% from 2021. Wheat prices are also down over 50% since highs made a year ago. Banks in 1893 became concerned and began to restrict credit as loans declined almost 10% from February to May. How familiar. We just had our own credit contractionary event as banks like Silicon Valley Bank went broke. And now all community and regional banks fighting for their own lives with uncertainty. In fact, First Republic went into receivership on Friday are restricting lending to everybody but the strongest of borrowers. Signs of distress became more frequent. On February 20th, 1893, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, yes, Reading Railroad from the Monopoly game, collapsed and filed bankruptcy. By spring, the government was struggling as gold was flowing out to redeem the treasury notes, and merchants against the law refused to accept silver. And by May, the struggle was over. On May 3rd, 1893, the stock market crashed. The New York Times said, quote, there was a smashing of values, almost without precedent. Figures posted at one moment were valueless the next, end quote. Reed continues, quote, on May 4th, a stock market favorite, the National Cordage Trust went into receivership. Shortly before the panic, Cordage Common Stock had sold for $70 per share. As Charles Albert Coleman vividly explains, quote, In the Cordage Trust circle of the New York Stock Exchange, hats were being smashed, coats torn, cravats ruined. Here was an agony that meant financial life or death to many. The shares went down to $12, end quote. My God, cravats were being ruined, people. It sounded like they were as trapped as I was between a portly passenger and a plane of patient potential poopers. As the economy crashed, unemployment skyrocketed to 16.7% by 1894. Reed writes, quote, the chief responsibility for the crisis rested with the attempted force feeding of the nation's money supply by government policy. End quote. The Commercial and Financial Chronicle said as much on July 8, 1893. Quote, the country is struggling with disturbed credit and the general derangement of commercial and financial affairs, which a forced and overvalued currency has developed. Nothing but corrective legislation, which shall remove the disturbing law, can afford any measure of real relief, end quote. Sound familiar? The silver buying legislation was removed later that summer, but the damage it caused would remain. Reed leaves us with this quote and lesson from historian Ernest Ludlow Bogart, quote, It must be said that the net results of this experiment of a, quote, managed currency, end quote, that is, one in which the government undertakes to provide the necessary money for the people were disastrous. For the maintenance of a suitable supply, the operation of normal economic forces is more reliable than the judgment of a legislative body, end quote. Sound familiar? We haven't had the breaking event yet, but all the ducks are in a row, and we are trapped just like I was on the plane. Like in the 1880s, America wanted the easy money that allowed for the buying of speculative Airbnbs so they could live on travel money and not work. The easy money of buying a house that was way too expensive for them or the easy money to buy that new Tesla, which at over $1,000 a month is a preposterous payment for a car. Americans today are driven by the same base urges to get something for nothing that the people driven by horses of the late 1800s had. Silver-backed currency may be a bygone, but human nature hasn't changed. No longer is it silver or even gold backing our currency. It is literally nothing, and we still want something for that nothing. 
Sincerely yours, C. Thomas Printer. This week's financial tip. Silver is at $25, and the all-time high was in January 1980 to $49 an ounce. What is the metric for following the dollar? Well, a very popular one that is used is called the Dixie, or dot .dxy on the ticker. However, we must know what is in these indexes so we can speak intelligently about them. The Dixie is made up of a basket of currencies, 57% euro, 14% Japanese yen, 12% pound sterling, 9% Canadian dollar, 4% Swedish krona, and 4% Swiss franc. This is a very popular way to quote the dollar, but there are no Chinese yuan or Russian rubles or Brazilian reals in this metric, so we can use it, but we need to know its limitations. And we will talk more about the dollar currency. Today's homework is to go read the article on fee.org by Lawrence Reed that I shamelessly quoted throughout today's show. But do it and not pay attention to the dates. It was written 45 years ago about events that happened 130 years ago. It was eerie to me, and I couldn't believe how prescient it felt. On this date in history, 234 years ago to be exact, George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States. Also born on this date, fittingly after the travels of C. Thomas being on the road again, country singer and songwriter Willie Nelson 